Hey, folks, thanks for checking out Reigniting Liberty. I'm Deneen Borelli, and Dr. Tom Borelli is in the house bringing you the truth in black and white. And we have a guest joining us today, folks, Michael Gonzalez, E. Pluribus Unum Senior Fellow at Heritage Foundation. Please visit heritage.org, folks. Michael is also the author of BLM, The Making of a New Marxist Revolution. Michael, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. We appreciate your time. We wanted to get into this amazing report that uh, you recently put out, and it's called How Cultural Marxism Threatens the United States and How Americans Can Fight It. Folks, please look up this report at heritage.org, download it, learn something, share it with your friends and family, because this is really important. So while we get started, Michael, I just want the basic 101 elevator pitch definition of cultural Marxism. Wow. How tall is the building that we're going to be traveling <laughs> in, in the elevator? Um, uh, cultural Marxism is a, a, an approach that uh, says that uh, it no longer is just material, uh, material forces that dictate how men and women, how men and women behave, but that cultural uh, issues matter. As one of its uh, great uh, uh, architects, uh, Antonio Gramsci in the 1920s said that uh, cultural issues are also material forces. Um, what it means is that it's not just your relationship to the means of production, but your family, your church, uh, your, your, your attachment to your feelings about patriotism that dictate how you are. And, and uh, they believed that uh, the workers were not rising and overthrowing the system because they have bought into all of these ideas. They were patriotic. They liked the family. They liked God. And what it sets out to do is infiltrate the institutions in order to indoctrinate people to, to change their way of thinking, to stop them from liking the family, liking God, liking the nation state, and then they can take over. Uh, in other words, it's, it's, it's a Marxism that is for the modern world and for those countries that cannot have a, a brutal revolution like, this, like, the, like Russia did in 1917, but where people have to take over step by step. It's, a, it's still a revolution, but it's a silent revolution. So uh, how is today's Marxism different? Well, today's Marxism is different from the old Marxism and in several ways. One is it no longer relies on the worker, the proletariat. Uh, this is, comes out of the writings of Antonio Gramsci, but also the German communists associated with the Frankfurt School in, in Germany in the 1920s and 30s, and then they migrated here. One of the things they, they one of the first steps they, they took was to get rid of the worker as a revolutionary agent that is something that succeeded in the 1960s with the new left. The new left is an American-born phenomenon that is heavily influenced by Gramsci and the Frankfurt School, in which they said, well, the worker is too happy. The worker of the, the industrial heartland in Ohio and Michigan, uh, everywhere in the U.S., is too contented with his home and his comfort creatures. He is not going to overthrow the system. So the, the, we have to rely on intellectuals and students, but then this is this a, a, a further evolution with Herbert Marcuse, a member of the Frankfurt School, which says, "Aha! It's the, it's it's the the ghetto population. This is these are his words. This is what he says. Um, it's the people of other races and other colors. Uh, again, his words that are going to be the revolutionary agents, and 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 then so the the worker." The, the, the left in the 60s, the new left, was looking for what was then called a substitute proletariat. And now it is a, a, a coalition of intellectuals, uh, Marxist intellectuals, and, and people of other colors and other races who are going to overthrow, who are going to be the, the revolutionary agents. This doesn't work in the practice, but this is one of the big differences. Another one is a, the focus on cultural issues, on the cultural life of the country, on how the beliefs, the norms, the culture of a place have to be uh, wiped out, have to be, uh, because they, they believed that people had false consciousness, <clears throat> which, 
when when you and I, the three of us, identify with the owners of capital uh, and we want things like possessions, material possessions, and want to go to church and want to have families, we have false consciousness. They have to raise our consciousness by getting rid of these other beliefs. So they, they really go to work on indoctrination. Uh, so cultural Marxism, that's the reason it's called cultural Marxism. That is another big uh, difference from the, 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 the beliefs of Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels that A, we needed a violent overthrow, bloody, with the proletariat killing the bourgeois, the owner of capital, raping his wife and daughter, etc. Uh, and and, 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 it, and it, uh, it happening because of material, for material reasons. So cultural Marxism is a step away from that. It's Marxism for the modern world, Marxism for the United States and Western Europe hmm. and Latin America. That's great, Mike, and thanks so much for joining us. And what we like to do here at Reigniting Liberty is not only tell people, explain to people what's happening, but why it's happening. And that's why we wanted to have you on as a guest. So my first thought is, and listen to your, your commentary here, is that it's, uh, cultural Marxism is really changed through the culture rather than through revolution, so to speak. Right. It is still a revolution, right? Right, but still, slower. everything but, but about America slower. would be wiped out. All the beliefs and norms and traditions. Uh, this is very tight. Uh, critical race theorists are, are cultural Marxists. They believe that uh, 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 that uh, racism is in the ordinary business of society. It's not something. Uh, it's not a sin or a crime that man commits. Uh, uh, it's it's something that society has in everything that it does. And so you have to change society and everything that it does uh, in order to, but but if you do that, that's still a revolution, right? And in, in China and Russia and Cuba, it took a revolution, an actual violent uh, stage uh, and a, 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 where, where the government was, was thrown out and, uh, and, 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 and uh, taken over, the, the, the country was taken over and you had firing squads, cultural Marxism, changes everything but without that bloody stage or at least violence is involved we have violence in the in the riots of 2020 but it's no longer that it's the violence when it comes will be more as a coup de grace a, a, a final uh overthrow of society the real work is painstaking it's on the taken for many years and it's indoctrinating i don't i hope i'm making myself clear i know that this is a lot to unpack yeah. no no you are it's, it's so, breathtaking well, yeah, so for uh, listeners and viewers, uh, if they were to look out the window or more specifically watch the news or read a newspaper, what examples of this cultural Marxism, what would they be seeing? Well, they would see uh, the signs on the lawns of people that say Black Lives Matter. Now, obviously, th this is a concept that is unimpeachable. You know, if, 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 if you don't believe that Black Lives Matter, then you're despicable, despicable in my eyes. But, but the organizations that were founded by, by people who were indoctrinated into Marxism, who were trained in Marxism under this label are, are Marxists. So, so if you see a Black Lives Matter sign on a restaurant or a storefront or a lawn, uh, that is a sign that you see. If you see anything that has to do with diversity, equity, and inclusion. Again, as in BLM, unimpeachable terms, except they have been disfigured. They have been redefined uh, uh, by, the, uh, by, by, by the Marxists. If you'd see anything that has to do with anti-racism, which is, of course, a very racist uh, uh, training uh, for, for to, 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 to wash people's brains, uh, to, to do brainwashing. So, so it's it's using race in the case of the United States because race we have such such so many centuries of problems due to race that it uses race in this country to do this undermining labor. So you refer to uh, Antonio Gramsci uh, a few times in your initial commentary. Can you describe who this individual is and what was his philosophy? And are we seeing the results of his philosophy today? Oh, my God, are we ever, you know, a, a I forget his first name, a, 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 a writer called Picone said, uh, made the, the observation 
that communism was Leninist between 17 and 24 when Lenin dies. Then it was Stalinist between 24 and 53 when Stalin dies. Then it was Maoist between 53 and 76 when Mao dies. And from the 80s on, we live in the Gramscian era of, of communism, of Marxism. Marx, Gramsci is, it describes uh, how to have a revolution in a place where you can have, you cannot have the revolution of the Bolsheviks in 1917. He is a man, he's a founder of Italy's Communist Party. He writes in the, in the 20s and 30s, a little bit in the, in the teens as well. But, but it's really not, he did, after he dies in 37, he's kind of forgotten. Uh, Stalin didn't much like him because Stalin is, was, Stalin was a, 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 a materialist. Um, and uh, he's mistranslated into Russian. He's not fully translated into English until 1970. Uh, the, 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 uh, the New Left Review begins to translate him. Uh, it's, a, it's a New Left publication in the, in, the, in, in the 1960s out of London. And here's a, a note of interest. The, the best uh, Gramscian, the, best, uh, the, the, the foremost American-based expert of Gramsci and the best translator of Gramsci is none other than Joe Buttigieg, the father of the uh, the former presidential candidate uh, Pete Buttigieg, oh, wow. who was a teacher at Notre Dame and who was the head of the Gramsci Society. Pete huh. Buttigieg grows in a very grows up in a very Gramscian household. Uh, some of the best translations of of Antonio Gramsci into English have been done by Joseph Buttigieg. Hmm. <laughs> Boy, <laughs> one small circle. <laughs> that explains a lot. <laughs> that explains a lot. Uh, wow. Yeah, and, and he is he the father of the slow walk through institutions. In yeah, so so a lot of people say that the long march through the institutions was something that Gramsci said. <clears throat> it's obviously obviously a Gramscian idea, but it's, it that line came from Rudi Dutschka, a a West German. Uh, uh, radical, uh, a very violent man, Rudy Duchka. Uh, he was a disciple of Herbert Marcuse. Herbert Marcuse was a philosopher of the Frankfurt School, to which I referred earlier. Um, uh, so Duchka comes up with this phrase, the long march of the institutions. Uh, by the way, when they have inside jokes, they're always about how Marxist they are. This is obviously a, a reference to Mao's long march in China, in the mainland China in the 1930s, when China and his communist partisans undertake a long march uh, through the snows of China as they fight the Kuomintang, the Nationalist Party. So it's a long march through the institutions with a very obvious nod to Mao. Uh, but it, what it means is we must take over the institutions <coughs> in order to <coughs> undertake this, uh, this acculturation this indoctrination to which I just referred, it is a, a of Gramscian origin, but it's 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 Duchka. He writes a letter to Marcuse from Germany. Marcuse responds, "This is brilliant. This is obviously the way to go." Wow, this is, uh, and we're surrounded by all of this nonsense. Uh, and I want to talk about the Democrats. I mean, they are certainly winning because they essentially own the institutions, the media, Hollywood. Uh, colleges and universities, Democrats own the infrastructure. How in the world did this happen? Well, I don't get into parties. Uh, I will say that in the in the midterms, the candidates that that were vocal about this, that had a policy approach and policy responses, did very well. Thank you. And I'm referring, obviously, to Ron DeSantis, who had several policies, whether it was with the universities or with Disney, or with the sexualization of children, he responded to these threats with policy, which is what politicians should do, not just give speeches, they should have pol policy remedies. Um, uh, look, I, I know a lot of people say, well, there's the Democrats that are associated with this. Republicans should understand this problem. They are, they are afraid. Many times I find that Republicans are too allergic to this because it, you have to talk about race. And you have to talk about sex, and you'd rather not talk about it. Uh, uh, but you, you ha we have to do it as we are doing it today here, because all, because they they're misusing, they're manipulating. The, I just I, I desire for real social justice, not the social the full social justice they're proposing. They manipulate p 
people's best in, be, be, best instincts in order to carry out this 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 missionary labor of indoctrinating us in, into a way from American traditions. You know, one of the areas that I'm focused on and both Danine and I actually, we worked in corporate America for over 25 years for me, over about 20 years for Danine. And what we see today in corporate America is an, basically an activist type corporation like Walt <coughs> Disney, for example. Uh, is this an example of uh, cultural uh, Marxism that now they've actually captured uh, the C-suites and, and boards of directors of corporation? And what yeah, absolutely. You know, the yeah. C-suite, um, the people who populate the C-suites come from the elite schools where this is taught. Uh, <clears throat> the, and, and not just the C-suites, people uh, who the new hires definitely all come from this, this single mindset. HR has been captured completely by this thinking. HR has become the, 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 the interior ministry, the police department right. of the corporation. Uh, if, you don't put out a, if, you don't, if you don't put a sign that says you're an ally on your desk, then you're not going to get that promotion. You could even be fired. Um, so, yes, this is a, 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 a and obviously uh, through ESG, uh, the work that have been undertaken by BlackRock, uh, the, the, the asset management firm, in, in forcing companies to adopt these rules, to adopt this, this woke approach. Woke is, an, is a word for, for this cultural Marxism. Uh, it's something that I think one Americans should be very aware of, not just as consumers and shareholders, but as voters. Policymakers in the different states have a role to play in this, as we saw again in Florida. Yeah, because a corporation is basically these days taking the role of companies. I mean, excuse me, of the country and, and lawmakers. If uh, the if a corporation does something, you, you you bypass the voter, and you know that that itself is is a real concern. And what also is I, really frightening to me is is the rate of speed, the way these things have changed so fast. Right. When I I was, when I was in corporate America, maybe 2000, 2000, 2003, four. Just before I left, they had the whole notion of corporate social responsibility, which was permeating the, co the company I work for and many others. The whole idea that the purpose of a corporation is not just to make money and return uh, revenue to shareholders or returns for shareholders. It was to effect cultural and social change. Right. And somehow, I guess that morphed into ESG. Absolutely. ESG. Uh, the, the, the S is, 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 is CRT. Um, this is, as companies, all this talk about moving away from shareholder value to stakeholder value is obviously a big part of all this. Um, as I said, there's, there's, there's room, ample room for government to act, especially um, with, without really transgressing on the free market. Uh, I think, again, the governor of Florida, by taking away a privilege that government had given Disney, was a very sussed way of doing this. Uh, it can also be done, as President Trump did it, through the, 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 the ban on the use of critical race theory by government contractors, uh, not just in the federal workforce. There are many different things that can be done. The state treasurer of West Virginia, uh, uh, his, his last name is Moore, is going to come to me in a minute. Uh, Riley Moore. He he created a list of companies that if they if they did not participate, if they if they if if they um, <coughs> uh, did not do contracts with fossil fuel companies, the state of West Virginia was not going to do contracts with them. Uh, if they boycotted anything to do with fossil fuels, well, West Virginia was going to boycott them. And I think this is just. A, several ways that these right. things can be approached uh, when it comes to the private sector. Well, you know, that that's a great point because, you know, when you, as the need referred to right now, uh, what they call, you know, the left, uh, use a different term than Democrats, but let's say the left, you know, own, basically owns these institutions, you know, the, you know, the media, academia, and, and now corporations, Hollywood. Uh, it is, you know, frightening when you look at the total size and scope and, and force uh, that these institutions have 
over our culture, right? But the, what you're referring to now, I think, is is most important is you know facing those <laughs> odds, and we're I would say underdogs in this. You know, how do we fight it? And I think you just started to mention the ways that uh, certain politicians are fighting against or pushing back against these institutions that are now advancing, you know, cultural views through through our country. Yeah, no, there's a lot we can do. We 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 should not give up by any means. The the the, the battle's not over. But I would again, you know, I hate to talk politics and political parties. I would not be giving the Republican Party the pass that you're giving. Republicans are it's too skittish when it comes to these issues, except for a few, uh, uh, you know, good exceptions. They don't want to talk about this. Trust me. Oh no, they, they, I agree. They'd rather I, no, not I, deal with it. No, I, I agree with that. They they run away while the uh, armada comes uh, sailing down. <laughs> right. Down the, down the thing, yeah. They're, they they want to be liked by the New York Times. They're afraid of corporations, so they want absolutely no, absolutely. They don't fight. <laughs> but my point is, the left owns the philosophy, the institution that's driving, the driving force, and then the Republicans run away. Yeah, the, yes, that's that's a very good way of putting it. And uh, just to mention real quick with ESG, uh, we are aware of some states that are pulling funds from BlackRock. So uh, BlackRock may have a lot of zeros behind their name, but these <laughs> states adding up, pulling their funds will add up to a lot of zeros as well and try to make a difference. It's about uh, 20 states now 20, that have okay. uh, joined forces with West Virginia with the state, state treasurer, Riley Moore. Yep. <clears throat> but then again, don't forget, you had CalPERS in California, Oh. which is really the 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 100 pound yeah. actor in in this uh, the the, the, the 1000 pound actor in this calpers has a lot of money and uh, new york uh, whatever the new york uh, equivalent of calpers is right. would also have a lot of money so so yeah we we do have about 20 states uh there should be more that are fighting esg good so uh, i want to switch gears go back to crt uh it seems CRT and discussions of sexual orientation with young children has, came out of nowhere. I mean, we, we have not heard so much about this so quickly in a short period of time, and it's <laughs> off the charts. And I guess it was after the pandemic uh, when kids were at home and parents were finally seeing what they're, what they're being taught, uh, their kids are being taught. If you could just talk to us about that. Yeah, I uh, <clears throat> have a different take on that. First, CRT has been around for a very long time, since the 70s. It, it, it receives its name first in 1989 at a, at, a, at a conference that they hold in a convent uh, in Madison, Wisconsin. But the reason why we've heard about it so much in the last two years is obviously because of 2020. <clears throat> you have the 2020 riots about 600 of them, more than 600 of them, that erupt in all of our societies. And then as a result of this and, and the, 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 the huge destabilizing impact of this violence that we have in 2020, the, 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 the leaders of the key institutions threw in the towel and said, yes, we have a bad racist country that we need to dismantle from the ground up. And this is done in the schools, in the universities in the houses of worship, the military, even the sports leagues. There's no escape, uh, no exit, to, to, to paraphrase Jean-Paul Sartre. Uh, you know, it, it is everywhere. And I think the American people uh, twig on to, the, to what is being done to the children in the classroom and what is being done to them in their places of work, uh, in their office or their factory floors in which they have to, they have to attend mandatory uh, anti-racist trainings which are quite racist in themselves and, and break the, violate the Constitution, the Civil Rights Act. And I think the American people are very smart, very, very smart. Uh, they, they, they don't want their children to be used as cannon fodder. They don't want their places of work to be, to be used for, for Maoist uh, uh, str struggle sessions. And they don't want the country they love to be changed. They have intuited all of this and they have fought back. So what I think we have seen is two steady years of the people saying enough. And you have people like Chris Rufo, a, a crusading journalist who, who, who should be commended, probably the most important conservative out there right now, James Lindsay, uh, uh, Vivek Ramaswamy. I do a lot on this. I think people are explaining to um, the American people. I travel the country extensively. I've been to, I think, 20 cities this year uh, because 
people want to know about this. Uh, and I go from, you know, high rises in Manhattan to, 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 to American Legion halls in Northern Ohio, talking to people because they want to hear, they want to know. Yeah, and, that is great. Uh, and, yeah. and another thing, people finding out about all of this stuff makes them emboldened. I mean, they're educated, but they also want to do something to make a difference. What is the feedback that you've, you've gotten from people? I get great feedback. I think I find the American people intellectually curious. They ask good questions. They've read about this themselves. And, 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 and you know, mothers, it's always, by the way, it's the women. By the, way, the women are leading here. Mm -hmm. The women and grand, the, the mothers and grandmothers who are hearing what their children are being put uh, through, the, 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 the privilege game, all the other things that are horrendous, and the sexualizing of children. Uh, it, 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 people have had it with this. And that's why you saw the sweeping election in Virginia, uh, uh, Governor Yunkin. Uh, again, Ron DeSantis rewarded. Um, uh, I, I, I'm actually optimistic because I think there has been an awakening to wokeness. No, that is very encouraging, the fact that uh, that information's out there. And, and like someone like DeSantis who pushed back against Disney, and like, as you mentioned, he's one of the rare Republicans that actually push back against a, a very, very, very big company. In fact, very big employer in his state. So that that certainly took a lot of courage for a, an elected official. Uh, you've mentioned Black Lives Matter a, a number of times. And what strikes me is, you know, years ago, not that long ago, you know, you know, race has always been part uh of our country and race issues. You've had the Al Sharptons and the Jesse Jacksons who, who would, you know, basically somewhat uh, ambulance uh, chasers who would then profit themselves <laughs> from their own advocacy. But it seems to me Black Lives Matter um, had so much more of an impact, you know, across the country. So can you explain uh, to our audience uh, about Black Lives Matter and how Perhaps they're different than Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton? Yeah, I mean, they're completely different. It's a, a different kettle of fish. You know, I don't agree with Jesse Jackson. I don't think Jesse Jackson is a communist. Moreover, I have never had a conversation with Jesse Jackson, never met him in person. I bet he loves America. I bet he wants to, he wants to change America. He wants to, to improve it. I don't agree with him again. But uh, the, 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 the people who founded Black Lives Matter are none of those things. They, you know, they were uh, they were recruited by hardcore communists, you know, over 10 years before they found the Black Lives Matter. They were they were instructed on Marxism, Leninism and on organizing and on Gramsci, Alicia Garza. Uh, she was recruited into the School of Unity and Liberation, which was founded by Harmony Goldberg, who is a, a, a one of the countries foremost experts on Gramsci. She is a, a cultural anthropologist who is a Gramscian. She founds the School of Unity and Liberation in which Alicia Garza is recruited <coughs> and taught Marx and Lenin. And then they, 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 they unleash this, this, this from, from Ferguson on, uh, this, this, this level of street violence, which, which then culminates in 2020 this is nothing at all to do with Jesse Jackson, who, 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 who by comparison, is, is just an average politician. Right, right. Well, uh, regarding Black Lives Matter, so are you surprised at the rate the organization blew up and also how quickly it fizzled out because they were uh, really discovered to be a, a fraud? And then also, what about all the money that they were able to uh, draw in because of the race card rhetoric, money that they have yet to really be accountable for. Well, two things, you know, on the money, <clears throat> I don't feel bad for the people who gave money to Black Lives Matter and, and their money was not used for social justice. It was never intended for social justice. Uh, they, 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 the people who gave this money were either virtue signaling or were just silly. Um, I, look, I, it's, a, it's a, in the fine tradition of communism for the leaders to have their country homes. Brezhnev and Andropov had, his, had their country dashas. Fidel Castro died a billionaire. And I'm actually happy that some, a lot of this money is being used to buy mansions in Los Angeles or Toronto 
uh, and not be used to dismantle the country. <clears throat> so we should talk about the, the, the malfeasance, but let's not dwell too much on it. It's the ideology uh, that matters as to they have gone away. Oh my God, no, they're writing policy with the White House. The White House uh, this year uh, put out, uh, I think it was 21, I wrote a paper about it with some colleagues here, 21 policy proposals, uh, which were co-written with Black Lives Matter. The day the White House put this out, Black Lives Matter said, we have helped the Biden team write the, the, these policies um, uh, since since December 2020, even before they, he became president. Um, and, and we're congratulating themselves. If you look at the, the we have, we have used FOIA to look at, at the emails that people in, in some departments have sent out. And, and they, a lot of these, their emails go to the founders of Black Lives Matter. I think Black Lives Matter is at peak power right now. They're, they're in our schools. Black Lives Matter at schools has, has uh, curricula in our children's schools. They're in the White House. Uh, you don't, they're not protesting in the streets because it, it will be superfluous. Why protest in the streets now? They have real power and that's what they care about. <laughs> they're basically going underground. Um one of the things you mentioned uh, that struck me about Black Lives Matter, I, I just have a general philosophy, especially when it comes to issues in Washington, D.C., is nothing happens by accident. <laughs> and when you, when you were describing the origins of Black Lives Matter, it, it seemed to me this is an example of that, that this was assembled and put together for a specific purpose. Yes. Yes. To... to, to, to to dismantle the United States, to, you know, Eric Mann, who, who trained Patrice Colores, is very open about what he wants to do. The media should quote him, but they don't. He says he wants to destroy the white settler state, the imperial state, the most oppressive country ever known to man. He's talking about the United States. <laughs> well... Nothing happens by accident. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I thank you for clarifying all of that, that they are, uh, you know, doing more, more damage and harm than we even realize. Uh, is there anything else that you would like to mention that we have not touched on in our discussion? Yeah, sure. This is a, you know, this is not a perfect country. Nothing is perfect. Capitalism is not perfect, right? Capitalism, the, one of the reasons why for the, 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 the durability of socialism is that capitalism has obvious imperfections. So does the United States have obvious imperfections. I know that Tom and I are imperfect. Deneen, I don't think you are. I mean, That's right. Right. <laughs> so, but, but, oh, Michael. <laughs> but, but, um, but, but this is a good country yes. of good people. Oh, uh, this is this is the best hope of man on earth, as Lincoln said. Still, people yeah. want to come here, as my parents did, because this is the, the the highest level of liberty, political liberty, and economic prosperity ever encountered by man. We should we should not dismantle this. We shouldn't have we should not have cultural genocide, a genocide of American culture. This is what is being attempted. We should open our eyes and deal with this through policy. Amen. Well any uh, social media handles or other websites you'd like to mention? Yeah, uh, Gundis Alves is my, it's my name in Latin. That's G-U-N-D-I-S-A-L-V-U-S. You can find me at Heritage, my book uh, on BLM, The Making of a New Marxist Revolution. It sells well on Amazon. I want to really thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you about this. These are issues that are obviously I think are supremely important. No, they're very important, and we're so glad you had the time to uh, join us, and we hope you'll come back. I will. All right. me. Good. Folks, Michael Gonzalez, E Pluribus Unum Senior Fellow at the Heritage Foundation. Visit the website, heritage.org. Folks, thanks for checking out Reigniting Liberty, and remember, everyone has a role to play. What are you doing for liberty? Until next time.